Okay, so we'll do inference on graphical models. So suppose we'll start with the simplest case. We'll consider the case of two nodes and we have the joint distribution x, y which can be say written as p x times p of y given x. Say for example, so this is the node x, this is node y and so we have p x known, we know p x and this edge might encode p of y given x. We are in the Bayesian network setting say. So we have access to px at this node and we have access to p of y given x. Let's say x belongs to a, b and c. So there are three values for x and we observe y. Okay, so we make an observation of y and we want to compute p of x equals a given y, p of x equals b given y, and p of x equals c given y. These are the values we want to compute. We want to compute the posterior given the observation. So, of course, we can use the Bayes rule. p of x given y is p of y given x times p x divided by p y. So this edge here, it encodes p of y given x. This node has p of x. So given the value of y and given the observation, given the different values of x, we can compute this for each value of x and compute p of x given y. But we will do this slightly differently so that it generalizes to uh, like arbitrary graphical models. So we'll do it in the following way. Step one. So what we will do is we will compute P of X given Y using a technique called message passing. I'll discuss what that is and see how it generalizes then to factor graphs and so on. So step one is, yeah. So step one is that node y computes the following vector my, this is the conditional distributions, p of y given x equals a, p of y given x equals b, and p of y given x equals c. This is what node y does. It has observed y. Let's say y is binary valued, y is 0 or 1. If it observes 0, it computes p of 0 given x equals a, p of 0 given x equals b, and p of 0 given x equals c. And it can do that because our graph has those two, has already fixed what p of y given x is on this edge, and it knows what px is. So it just uses this function, if y is 0, it will set 0 there, for each x equals a, b and c, it will just compute these quantities. This is known as a belief vector in the literature. And it sends my is transmitted, if you like. In step two, node x uses its prior vector uh, 
mx which is p of x equals a p of x equals b and p of x equals c and thus element wise multiplication by dot mx which is p of x equals a and p of y given x equals a p of x equals b times p of y given x equals b p of x equals c times p of y given x equals c it does this element wise multiplication and so it has computed these quantities and then and normalizes this vector okay so it has these three quantities it then computes them and normalizes it to compute P of x equals a given y, P of x equals b given y, and P of x equals c given y. So the idea is node y upon it making an observation sends a message to node x. Node x uses its prior information to compute this quantity and then it normalizes things to compute the posterior. So with this sort of simple example, let's see how we can do inference on a chain. Do one more simple example. So suppose our graphical model is a chain. And now, so now the joint distribution is of the form 1 over z psi of x1, x2, psi 1 of x1, x2, psi 2 of x2, x3, up to psi n minus 1 of xn minus 1, xn. Say our joint distribution is of this form. So now we can write it as a chain like this. So there is psi 1 here, psi 2 here, psi n minus 1 here. These are our potentials. Okay. And we assume say each xi is in some set x which is of the form a1, a2 up to a k. Our task, so here we make no observations. We are just given this graphical model. We assume that these functions are known. So psi 1, psi 2 up to psi n minus 1 is known to us because the graphical model is specified. Z is not known in general. And we want to compute simply the marginals. We want to compute say p of x1, p of x2 and so on up to p of xn. This is our task. We want to compute uh, the marginals. So the joint distribution is already known at least up to a normalizing constant. So the simplest thing is to just to say if we want to compute p of xn All we have to do is just compute this and we sum over x1 to xn minus 1, xn plus 1 up to x capital N. So why can't we do this? So everything here is actually very supposed to be very easy, right? We are given the full joint distribution, just the normalizing constant is not known. But other, but other than that, we can just sum over this. If you don't worry about z, this needs to be normalized in the end, which is very easy to do because say everything is binary valued, then you just have to normalize it. 
So why don't we do this? Why don't we just sum over all the variables? So this is really the problem. There are no observations. You have a graphical model that basically specifies a joint distribution up to a normalizing constant. And you want to only compute the marginals, px1, px2, up to pxn. Say little n is 1, so you just want to compute px1. So what you have to do is you just have to basically sum these distributions up from x2, x3, up to x capital N. Now, you may not know the z, but that's not a problem because you will, let's say everything is binary valued, you will compute px1 equals 0, you compute px2 equals x1 equals 1, and then you normalize them. Then That's very easy to do. So let's say everything is binary valued for simplicity instead of k values, then what you will do is you will compute px1 equals 0, px2 x1 equals 1, and normalize if you need to. And the way you will compute this is just by summing over whatever you have from x2 to x capital N. So why wouldn't you do this? What, what would happen? Because if you do this, then the problem is solved. You don't need to do anything more sophisticated. ideas? So if we can, yeah, yeah? Does it, the computation get out of hand then? Like, it grows like the amount? Yeah, so what is happening here is basically if we want to do this, we have to sum over say x1, x2, up to x n minus 1, x n plus 1, xn of the joint. So this one, let's say everything is binary value. This takes two values, this takes two values, this takes two values. We have essentially two to the n different terms you have to sum over. And if n is 20, already you have to a huge summation you have to do. That's just, that is the problem. So even marginalizing a joint distribution is not an easy thing to do in this, in this sort of literature. Um, cannot just trivially marginalize things because the summation will be very over a very big space. That's why you need more efficient algorithms. This requires 2 to the n uh, computation. However, if we know that our graphical model is of this form, we can develop a linear complexity algorithm that marginalizes things. So, however, the structure of graphical model will enable a linear complexity method to compute P of X. So it can, instead of doing this brute force summation, which is exponential in the number of variables, you can figure out a way that is only linear. Okay, any questions? Why this is exponential and so on? So the problem we are trying is very simple. There is no observations. There is just a joint distribution and we have to marginalize it. So that's all it is. Then we will see how to extend it if some of the variables are observed. So what we want to ideally do is maybe you observe x1, x2, and xn, and then want to compute the rest conditioned on those. So you may observe some of the variables, and you want to compute the posterior probabilities of others conditioned on this, like we did in the simple two-node example. So those are the two things we want to do. First, we just want to compute the marginals, and then we will compute the conditionals given some observations.
Okay. So let's make a key observation. Let's consider the summation that we want. We have summation over x1, summation over x2, summation over xn minus 1, summation over xn plus 1, up to xn. And then the joint distribution is of the form psi1 of x1, x2, up to psi n minus 1 of xn minus 1, xn. This is what P of xn is. This is what we want to compute, right? Now, among all these terms, this is the only term that depends on xn. So what I can do is I can take this summation all the way inside and it won't change anything. I will take this quantity and bring it in this here. So I'll write it as summation of x1 to xn minus 1, xn plus 1 up to x capital N minus 1 psi 1 of x1, x2, psi 2 of x2, x3, up to psi n minus 2 of xn minus 2, xn minus 1. And then here I will put in summation over xn of psi n minus 1, xn minus 1, and xn. So I'm bringing the last summation inside. This times this quantity. So I can do the summation and let's give it a name. Let's call it mu beta n minus 1 of xn minus 1. This is the summation over xn psi n minus 1 of xn minus 1 xn. Okay. So now my left hand side becomes summation of x1 to xn minus 1 xn plus 1 to xn minus 1 of psi 1 of x1 x2 psi 2 of x2, x3 up to psi n minus 2 of xn minus 2, xn minus 1 times this quantity which is mu beta of n minus 1, xn minus 1. All I did was I replaced this by a quantity which is mu beta of xn minus 1. So now what do I see? Out of all these factors, it's only the last two that depend on xn minus 1. The rest are not dependent on xn minus 1. So now what I can do is I can bring the summation of xn minus 1 all the way up to here. So this is now the summation of x1 to xn minus 1, xn plus 1 to xn minus 2 of psi 1 of x1, x2, psi 2 of x2, x3 and so on. And then I'm summing inside here xn minus 1. mu beta n minus 1 x n minus 1. Okay. And I will give this again another name. I will call this quantity to be mu beta 
of n minus 2 xn minus 2 and keep continuing so now I have defined so this is what it is so what we did was we had this summation again the first step was to marginalize the last term with respect to xn that's easy to do because if this is a binary value we're just summing over 0 and 1 that's just two quantities to add then you get this quantity. If xn minus 1 is 0, you have u beta n minus 1 0, where you fix this to 0. And when xn is 1, you will fix this to 1 and then do the summation. So you will have one value for 0, one value for 1. Right? Now what you do is you compute mu beta of n minus 2. Mu beta of n minus 2 is obtained by taking the summation over xn minus 1 of psi n minus 2 xn minus 2 xn minus 1 times mu beta n minus 1 of xn minus 1. This was just computed in the previous step. So you multiply that with psi, sum over xn minus 1, you get mu beta n minus 2 of xn minus 2. And you keep going backwards like this. You just keep iteratively going on. Okay, so now I have defined mu beta xn minus 2 is the summation over xn minus 1 psi n minus 2 of xn minus 2 xn minus 1 times mu beta n minus 2 of xn minus 2. So now that we have seen some structure, let's go and look at how the expression will simplify. So we are interested in computing Pxn, which is a summation over all the terms. So let's look at this summation. We can write it as summation over xn plus, it's proportional to, won't be equal to because of the normalizing constant, but that's okay. So it's proportional to summation over xn plus 1, psi n of xn, xn plus 1, summation over xn plus 2, psi xn plus 1, xn plus 2, so on, up to summation over x capital N minus 1, psi n minus 2, of xn minus 2, xn minus 1, summation over xn, psi n minus 1 of xn minus 1 xn. This is one term and then we'll multiply again the summation of the remaining terms x1 to xn minus 1, psi 1 of x. We still have to account for this set of terms. So we had to compute Pxn, we had to sum over x1 to xn minus 1 and xn plus 1 up to xn. Now based on what we saw on the previous page, we can decompose at least the second half of the variables for now as starting from xn, computing this. This is, as per our definition, mu beta n minus 1 of xn minus 1. Once we compute that, we multiply it with this quantity. This term is mu beta of n minus 2 xn minus 2. And then we keep continuing. We keep going backwards until we are here. Right? So at this point, 
we would have computed mu beta of little n plus 2, actually little n plus 1, I think, of xn plus 1. And the last step will allow us to compute mu beta of n xn. So we first compute this by marginalizing over xn. Then we just stored sum over x over xn minus one. We just stored sum this function psi. We multiplied by the function mu beta of n minus one. Take the multiplication, then sum over xn minus one. Then go to xn minus two. Keep doing it until we have finally computed mu beta of xn in a stepwise fashion. Now for the remaining part, we can do the same thing. We can do the same factorization. However, we start from psi 1, then we compute psi 2 and so on. So for the second term, <coughs> we can write it as summation over xn minus 1 psi n minus 1 of xn minus 1 xn summation over xn minus 2 psi n minus 2 of xn minus 2 xn minus 1 and so on up to summation over x2, psi2 of x2, x3, and summation over x1, psi1 of x1, x2. The second term can be written in this way. We take x1 in the innermost summation. Okay. Now this is the only term that depends on x1. Once we compute x1, we have some function here. We'll call this term mu alpha of x2. Okay? Because here we are summing over x1 with x2 held fixed. Then we have this term. This term is mu alpha of x3. So now we take this mu alpha of x2, we do point wise multiplication with psi 2 of x2, x3. So now we get mu alpha of x3 and we keep proceeding until here we compute mu alpha of xn minus 1 and I should put the subscripts. I should put 2 here, I should put 3 here. And so this is mu alpha of xn minus 1 uh, at n minus 1. And this here allows us to compute mu alpha of n xn. So once, once I compute mu alpha n minus 1 of xn minus 1, I multiply by psi n minus 1, and the final thing I get is mu alpha n of xn. Okay? So we have computed these quantities, and now what we have basically is that T xn, so just so that I write, I haven't formally defined what mu alpha is. So mu alpha of 2 x2 will be the summation of psi of what do we have x1 and x2 summation is over x1 mu alpha 3 of x3 is the summation over x2 psi of x2 x3 times mu alpha 2 of x2 and so on up to mu alpha n of xn. This will be the summation over xn minus 1, psi xn minus 1 and xn times mu alpha 
uh, of Sn minus 1. This is how we recursively compute the uh, functions at each of those nodes. And once we have computed them, Pxn is simply going to be proportional to mu beta n of xn. That comes from this first term. So we had this product. This last term here was mu beta n of xn times mu alpha n of xn. We can do this for each value of xn. If xn is 0, we will do this. If xn is 1, again we will do this and then multiply the 2, like the 2k, and then normalize it. So this shows a natural structure for message passing. So what we have now is that imagine we had a no graph like this, x1, x2, x3, up to xn minus 1, xn, xn plus 1, xn plus 2, up to xn minus 1, and xn. So we first have, in a sense, messages being sent. from node xn backwards up to this node and we have messages being sent forward from x1 up to this node. So what we have here is mu beta of n minus 1 of x, x capital N minus 1. This was the first backward message from node x capital N to x capital N minus 1. Then we, from this we had a second message. We have a message here. This is mu beta of n minus 2 of xn minus 2. Right? Once we computed this, we can compute this and so on up to the time we get mu beta n plus 1 xn plus 1 and mu beta n of xn. This is how the messages from the last node go up to xn. Likewise, we'll have forward messages coming from nodes. So we, here we have mu alpha 2 of x2, mu alpha 3 of x3. We'll get mu alpha n minus 1 of xn minus 1, mu alpha n of xn. So these are backward messages, these are forward messages, and we basically then multiply them and normalize with respect to all values of xn, and that's how we will compute the marginal distribution. Okay. So in other words, what we do is we recursively compute mu alpha of xi to be the summation of psi i minus 1, xi minus 1 times xi times mu alpha of i minus 1, xi minus 1 over all values of xi minus 1. That's the forward message. Similarly, the backward message is mu beta of xj mu beta j of xj is computed as psi j of xj xj plus 1 times mu beta j plus 1 of xj plus 1 over all values of xj plus 1. So we compute them. The node n receives two vectors, it will get mu alpha n 
let's say our alphabet is a1 a2 up to ak so it gets this thing so imagine that our alphabet is not binary but it is a1 to ak then for each value of xn when xn is a it gets this message from the forward path this message from the forward path and so on and it also gets mu beta n of a1, mu beta n of a2, up to mu beta n of a k. And then what it does is it just does pointwise multiplication and normalization. So p n of a k is mu alpha n of a k, mu beta n of a k divided by the summation of mu alpha n of a k mu beta n of a k over a k this this is how the marginal distribution gets computed at each node so in terms of complexity how many operations do we need to do here order k right we have just sum over k terms how many operations do we need to do here? We still need to do order k operations. So the complexity here is order 2k because it has to be done for both. However, this has to be done for each value of xi. For xi equals a1, xi equals a2 and so on. So what we need is order 2k square operations. If xi is a1, then you will sum over all k values of this, and that will be order k operations. Then xi is a2, you will again sum over all k values. So for each of the terms, you have to do order k operations, and there are k of these values. So you do order 2k square. And then you have to do it across all the nodes. There are n nodes. So the total computations is going to be order of n k square. So this is completely now linear in the number of nodes. Previously, we had an exponential. We had to sum over all 2 to the n combinations. We just did brute force. This is now linear in the number of nodes. So any questions about anything, notation, hopefully this is all pretty clear. So this is known as a message passing algorithm because you are passing messages forward and backwards. Okay, great. But now let's say that suppose We want to simultaneously evaluate all marginals. So we want to evaluate px1, px2, up to pxn. Instead of just one quantity, one px, one marginal, we want to evaluate all of them. We could go and repeat this calculation at node one could repeat this calculation at node 2 and so on. For each marginal, we will need this many computations. So if we were to do it at all the nodes, we will need n times these many calculations. So the simplistic thing would be to repeat this algorithm at node 1. That will require order n k square operations. Repeat this algorithm at node 2. That will need another, another n k square operations. And so total number of computations is order n square k square. And again, this is not nice because it scales as n square. If n is going to be very large, this will make the algorithm slow. 
but it is clear that if you were to repeat this over and over there will be a lot of duplications in the messages being computed and so we can easily make it faster and that is the idea behind something called the forward backward algorithm. So the forward backward algorithm basically says that you do not have to just restart at each time. So you have the nodes x1, x2, x3 up to xn minus 1 and x capital N. What you do is you start sending the forward messages like we did before but go all the way till the end of the network. You don't have to stop at an intermediate node xn. You just propagate the messages all the way to the end of the network. So you will have mu alpha of x2 here, mu alpha of x3, mu alpha of x4, up to mu alpha of xn. So go all the way. Don't stop anywhere in the middle. Go all the way till the end of the node network. Then you do the backward pass. This is the forward pass. Then you do the backward pass. We have x1, x2, x3, xn minus 1, xn. Again, you do the entire backward pass. Now what do you do after this? How would you compute the probabilities? Let's say how would I compute any PXN? So I have done the forward pass where I have propagated these messages from the first node to the last node. Then I independently do a backward pass. So what do I do in that? It's as if you had done a, a pass both ways to each of the intermediate. Exactly. All you have to now do is you just take mu alpha n of xn, mu beta n of xn. So the probability is proportional to that and you normalize. That's basically it. For the first and the last nodes, you only have one message. The other one is a constant message. So you don't just have to take it as a one and that does it. Okay, now the next question is how do we deal with observed nodes? Suppose we observe that one particular node has a fixed value alpha. Like that node the value does not change. Okay. And we want to compute, say, P of x1 given xj equals alpha, P of x2 given xj equals alpha, and so on. We want to compute the conditional probabilities given this observation. Then it's easy to see that the message is mu alpha of xj plus 1 this message has to be modified by clamping xj to alpha. xj, you do not marginalize over xj, you just set xj to alpha. Right? So all you have to do is you take psi j of xj, xj plus 1. This was our original message passing algorithm. 
but you don't propagate this message forward. You have to multiply it simply by the indicator function that xj is alpha. So when you do the forward passing, you know the value of xj is alpha. So when you sort of do the forward pass, you do not just multiply by mu alpha of xj. You set all the other terms to zero if they are not in the, for xj if they are not equal to alpha, because xj is now fixed to alpha. So that's the only change you have to do when you have observations, and you will automatically get the conditional probabilities. This is the summation over all xj, and similarly when you send the message out of this node. You technically have to, this was our original thing. This was our original recursion for computing the backward message. But now all you have to do is simply clamp it to xj. You do not not average it out with respect to xj. So you simply again multiply it with xj. And recall that this is simply the indicator function that xj equals alpha. Okay, so all you have to do is you have to just simply for any node that is observed, you simply tweak the forward and backward messages by clamping that node to that value instead of averaging over all the values. Because now you are not summing over them, you are fixing the value to alpha. And when you do this, no matter how many observations you have, you just keep doing this trick and you'll be conditioning on all those observations. And that will give you the posterior distribution right away. So the message passing is a fairly simple algorithm now on the chain, like at least when the graphical model is a chain, and it will allow you to compute all the marginal distributions and the conditional distributions. Okay, so now what if you had to compute, say, some joint distribution of the neighbors? Let's say you have to compute this. So you have a chain where this is xn minus 1, this is xn, and you have psi of xn minus 1, xn, the potential here. But you don't want to just compute the marginals of xn minus 1 and xn. You want to compute the joint distribution. Any ideas how you will do it? So suppose you have some message here. You have a forward message. Call it mu alpha n minus 1 of xn minus 1. You have mu beta n of xn. You, go, you run, run the forward backward algorithm. So you get mu alpha and mu beta, and you have a potential. How will you compute the joint distribution? We saw how to compute individual marginals, but sometimes you might be interested in the joint distribution between neighbors. So. You understood the message passing algorithm and how we derived it. This should not be too hard. Can't you just compute the one uh, marginal and then multiply it by the many? The one. So if you can compute the marginal of this, mm -hmm. you can compute the marginal of this. But that's not how the, like, we yeah. want to compute the joint of this, right? But, so, because isn't our potential our conditional probability? The I potential know. is not, it's just a factorization. It's not really any directly a condition. It just tells us that the dependence between these two is governed by this function. Like, if you sum this over xn, you won't get the marginal of xn minus 1. You have to use all the information.
Okay. So let's go back. If we don't see it right away, we have to go to the definition. We want to compute this. This is the sum over x1 to xn minus 2, xn plus 1 up to xn of this quantity. Psi 1 of x1, x2, psi 2 of x2, x3, psi of xn minus 1, xn, right? So what do we do now? We have, we have, we have to remove two terms, xn minus 1 and xn. So what I can do now is I can write this as summation over x1 to xn minus 2 of psi 1 x1 x2 psi 2 x2 x3 up to psi of xn minus 3 xn minus 2 psi of n minus 3 this is one term then I have one psi remaining which I am not summing up there is no summation involving these variables, so I will just keep it a separate. And I have the summation over xn plus 1, xn plus 2 up to x capital N of psi n, xn, xn plus 1. I think I should have one more here, psi n minus 2, xn minus 1, right? Uh, psi n plus 1 of xn plus 1, xn plus 2, up to psi n minus 1. So I can write it like this, right? So note that this quantity is going to be the whole thing here after you do the forward propagation is going to be mu alpha n minus 1 of xn minus 1. This quantity will be mu beta of n xn. So in other words the joint distribution is proportional to mu alpha n minus 1 of xn minus 1 times mu beta of n xn times psi of xn minus 1 xn. It's a product of these three things. So you have another way is that you can think of this as a super node. Okay. There is a message coming here, a message coming here, and you want to find the joint distribution. So you take these two and you multiply it by the potential. That is all that is happening here. And then you normalize. However, when you normalize, now you have to like sum over all combinations, k square combinations. And now things start getting complex. If you had three of them, it would be K cube combinations, and that's where the complexity kicks in. So marginal distribution and pairwise marginals are relatively easy between neighbors, but other quantities are still going to be difficult. Any questions about this? So now it turns out that if you go to more general models, the most natural way of describing uh, how to compute, do inference for general graphical models is to factor graphs. They tend to be more convenient than other models. So
using factor graphs. So again, like let's do a quick review of factor graphs. We discussed them very briefly before the break. I'll do a quick review. Suppose I have some values. And like as we saw in the case of undirected graphical models, but it also applies to directed graphical models, the joint distribution can be written as a factor over a subset, factors over a subset of random variables, where each excess is a subset of x1, x2 up to xn. So for example, we have P of X1, X2, X3. We might be able to write it as FA of X1, X2, FB of X1, X2. Maybe there are two products involving the same variables. FC of X2, X3, FB of X3, right? So the way we would represent this using a graphical, uh, using a factor graph is that we have three variable nodes and in this case four factors. So FA involves X1 and X2, FB involves X1 and X2, FC involves X2 and X3, FD involves X3. So all factor graphs are bipartite graphs where you have variable nodes and you have factor nodes. And only connections between variable nodes and factor nodes are permitted. You have no connections between variable nodes themselves and no connections between factor nodes. That's why these are bipartite graphs. So now there is a concept of cycle free factor graphs. These are basically graphs that don't have cycles. So this is an example of a cycle free factor graph. Okay. Uh, here is another example. Of a node which has a cycle. This node has a cycle of length cat computed six. So we go like this. Like this, and then we go back. So it's a cycle of length 6. Turns out that we can do exact inference is possible on cycle free graphs using something called the sum product algorithm. So there is a generalization of the message passing algorithm on the chain. It's known as a sum product algorithm that we will discuss and that will give us exact inference. So computing the exact marginal distribution on uh, cycle free graphs. If you have graphs with cycle, the algorithm, the algorithm is not going to be exact, but it still works reasonably well in practice. But there are no guarantees once the graph has cycles in it. Okay, so what I will do is we will have to do the formal thing next time, but I'll just give you some intuition of what the method is. So let's look at the following picture. Let's consider an arbitrary variable node A 
in a factor graph. So let's say this node is here. It's connected to a bunch of factor nodes. The only neighbors it can have are factor nodes. Okay. So let's give one name here. Let's call this node fs. Okay. And let's say the other nodes are factors are f1, f2 up to fm. So these are all the factors that are neighbors for this particular node. Okay. Now each factor will in turn be connected to other nodes that will in turn be connected to factors and so on. Uh, so this will be sort of one set of nodes, F1 will have its own factor, again variable nodes, F2 will have its own variable nodes and so on. I will assume a cycle pre graph, so this is how the structure will be. There won't be any cycles connecting like this. For a cycle free graph, this is a decomposition we will study. Now, clearly, we can write the joint distribution of Px. Okay. The total probability, so P of say x1 up to xk, which is what this is, is the product of all s in the neighborhood of x. So we take all the factors in the neighborhood of x, which will be fs, f1, f2 up to fm fs f1 f2 up to fm of the quantity fs of x and xs here xs is the set of variable nodes with fs as the root so these ones will in our notation be xs, these ones will be x1, x2 and so on. And fs is the product of all factors in the subtree with fs as the root. So all we are doing is you know px is a product of all the factors okay, in the factor graph. We are focusing on one node and we are saying that the joint probability will factorize as a product of these terms. So this is Fs, this is capital Fs of X and Xs. So this will be the product of all the factors with Fs as the root, then all the factors with F1 as a root, all the factors with F2 as a root and so on. So you're just basically rewriting that big product uh, into a sum of product, into a product of terms rooted around fs, f1, f2 up to fm. So this can always be done because we just group the products. Now what we will claim is that, that we want to introduce some messages. We want to have, just like we did in the case of a chain, we want to have now some messages being propagated from the factors to the, this node. So we will have mu of fs to x, this will be mu of f1 to x, mu of f2 to x, and so on. So what we want to now do 
is basically generalize what we did in the case of a chain. We want to say that there will be some messages that will come from all the factor nodes to this variable node. And we want to say that the probability, the marginal probability at x is a product of all these messages. So, so we would like to define mu of fs to x in such a way that px is the product of these messages. And that can be done in a fairly natural way. So, recall that Px is the sum of x over this the entire set x1 to xk minus, let's say we are the ith node, xi of P of x1 to xk, which is marginalizing out over all variables. This is the sum over x1 to xk minus xi of the product of s in the neighborhood of x, xi of fs of xi and x. Then I can interchange the product and the summation. This is just from the definition we saw. This joint distribution is a product of xi and x. Xs of fs of xi and xs. And we will simply define this to be the message that we are interested in. This will be defined as mu of fs to x of xi. So in a sense, we now had to develop a recursive algorithm to compute this quantity, the messages. And we'll see the same sort of approach that we had in the chain will carry over to the factor graph. We will figure out a way to recursively compute the messages that are sent from the factor node to the variable nodes and sum them up so that we get the marginal distribution. So this will continue on in the next lecture. In the next lecture, we'll finish inference and we'll start the problem of learning graphical models.